So in the testing of the part auto scaler, um, one of the problems has to be that you need to simulate something quote unquote realistic. You need to simulate a process that receives requests, does something with those requests and sends back a response. Um, now in the performance tests for the autoscaler, the way this is achieved is to provide an autoscaler test image. Uh, and I am in fact using that autoscaler test image. So I can show first of all, the Knative services that I have running. I have a hello, which I'm gonna get rid of because it's not really that interesting today. So I'm sorry, hello, you're going away. Okay, so now if I do my service list, I get just the one that I'm interested in. Um, the thing to note with that is that this service is using the test image. I created a version of the test image. I compiled it. I ran the Docker file. Uh, it's on a repository somewhere. Uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, a registry somewhere. Uh, and now it's receiving traffic. Now, if you look down the bottom here, you can see that I am scraping K, uh, beg your pardon, not Knative, I am scraping Kubernetes to see what's going on. How many pods are there? And this uh, should give you the clue that one of the reasons it's called the Knative pod autoscaler is that because it's about pods. It's not uh, at all about, you know, scaling the size of things. It doesn't really try to do anything with the cluster. All it does is create more or fewer copies of pods. Um, now in this respect, it's like the horizontal pod autoscaler. Um, the next thing I'm going to talk to you about is the uh, fact that I can, in fact, talk to it. So let me see if this does a thing. HTTP is a very nifty little program for producing nice results. It's nice and slow. It takes a couple of seconds to come live because that uh, image had not been running. In fact, it had been autoscaled to zero. And now you can see down the bottom that it has created one copy. There is one copy running. Uh, and that's what responded to my response. So if I run this again, I get a quicker response. And to prove that I'm not lying to you, you can have a look at the Envoy upstream header, which says that you know there was three and a half seconds, which was basically two and a half seconds of launching a container uh, and one second of sleep. And then the same here, I can say, we see that the amount of sleep time and the amount of execution time are the same. So this is actually a very helpful and useful service. So, so far I've proved what I say I'm doing. The next thing I'm going to do is find this guy. And I'm going to show you a program called Hey. I'm just going to be lazy and use a GitHub search because I can never quite remember whose it is. Um, hey is a very simple load generator. Um, load generation, by the way, is surprisingly tricky, like auto scaling, to do correctly. And again, easy to describe and hard to do. Um, uh, I'll, I'll make a tangent here for a minute. In load testing, there's this thing called the okay, coordinated emission problem, which was described by, I think, Giltine from Azul. Um, it's, it's worth having a look into this. The gist of it is that suppose you have a load tester that produces 100 requests per second or at least claims to produce 100 requests per second. More likely, it's something like it has 100 agents that produce requests, and if they haven't recruited, you know, produced a request in a second, they send a request and wait for the response and so on. What happens is that the speed of the requests will actually be limited by the thing being tested. So if you're trying to get 100 RPS, but the system only can handle 50 RPS, what tends to happen is that load generators wait for responses. And because they wait for responses, they automatically become you know, entangled or entrained or tied up to the rate of the system under test. So you only ever see the system at its own local optimum. You don't get to see the system when you push it past its limits. And that's the coordinated emission problem because these two systems have in some sense coordinated to emit a number of requests that you wished were sent. Interestingly enough, I believe as an amateur uh, that this is an example of what's known in queuing theory as a closed queue. Um, there is this idea in queuing theory of the open network or the open queue and the closed queuing network. 
Um, the difference is that an open queue uh, simulates people arriving at a queue, moving through the queue, being serviced, and then leaving. And a closed queue represents something like where you have a fixed number of people who are always in the queue, but what's actually going around and around is requests. So the example of this that's always given historically was you have a large mainframe, everybody has a terminal, and you have users who type commands into the terminal, and then they get a response, and then they think for a while, literally called think time. And they think for a while, and then they send another request to the system. Um, and if you look at it, that's actually a description of the coordinated omissions problem. The rate at which requests arrive at the, at the server is governed by the rate at which responses come from the server. They're not disconnected as they are in an open queue. This actually turns out to be quite important, um, believe it or not. And if you want to be a real stickler about load generation, you need to really know for realsies which one you're dealing with. Now, the reason I chose Hay is not because of some principal reason to do with any of this theoretical discussion. I just think it's a really cool topic and I wanted to talk about it for a while. No, the reason I choose Hay is that it's very easy to use and it's very easy to install. And it does a reasonable job at concurrency. I wouldn't say that it's like perfect, but it's, it's reasonable. Now, it does something like what I could do here with HTTP. Uh, or HTTPI is the name of the product, um, if you're wondering. HTTPI, ta-da, good stuff, uh, HTTPI.io. Um, and also there's another one that I saw in the modern Unix repo, um, which I've been meaning to try, and I haven't yet. But there's a lot of these modern Unix tools. Okay, egg. A XH, this one. Okay, so naturally it was near the bottom because it starts with an X. Hey is a very simple tool. It lets me set concurrency. It lets me set a rate limit, as in a maximum rate limit. Now that you are aware about the difference between um, at a closed and an open queue, uh, my interpretation of how Hey works is that it behaves like a closed queue, which means that in theory it faces the coordinate coordinated emission problem, but at a certain level, that actually doesn't matter for us. Um, what we're interested in is the visual behavior of the autoscaler rather than sort of theoretical perfection. I'm, I'm not trying to test the system to destruction. I'm not trying to establish a curve of performance. Uh, I just want to get some stuff on screen to impress you. So the first thing I'm going to do is, first of all, I'm going to scroll through my history. I believe this is the one I want. And so what it says is that we're going to run for 31 seconds at a concurrency of 50 instances. And I'm just going to load that for 10 for a second. We're going to run it 31 seconds long. We're going to have 10 concurrent agents uh, or threads sending requests to our image. Our image has been programmed to wait 50 milliseconds before responding. And so the place to watch is down the bottom. What you're going to see is a bunch of instances spring to life. Uh, as soon as it's ready. I mean, one will come up and then a bunch will come up and you can see it's already starting some. Oh, there we go. Or it's starting two because I set the concurrency pretty low. I mean, 31 seconds is, is how long it's going to run. Um, it'll become apparent later on why I chose 31 seconds, but the gist of it is uh, I couldn't get Prometheus to do what I wanted to do. That, that is the terrible, the terrible truth. There you go. So it runs. You can see that the distribution of time is more or less as you would expect. I've got 113 requests per second, um, which sort of makes, well, some sense. Two, so 50, 50 milliseconds. Yeah, I think there's just a bunch of additional noise here that I don't have a particularly strong answer for. That longest request is going to reflect that it was sleeping, so I'm going to run it again. And what I'll expect is that slowest request will drop to something much more like the average. Oh, hello. Interestingly, you could see that the autoscaler is killing one that it felt that it didn't need anymore. Um, that doesn't always happen. OK, here we go. And yes, as I expected, the slowest is now much more snappy uh, because we're not dealing with a cold start. Um, one thing I was not able to recreate, uh, and you'll see this later on, is the effect of cold starts on very large panics. And if that seems a little vague and mysterious, it's only because I've only just started the show. Now we can play with these different settings. So for example, if I turn up the number of concurrent agents, 250, 
you will see a much more aggressive um, response from the autoscaler. Right? It will basically say, okay, there are now far more requests coming in, uh, far more requests that need to be dealt with, and therefore I'm going to create more containers. And these containers still take several seconds to uh, bring to life. That's what, uh, what they pay you for. In the book, I mention, and I think this is still true, that you should give consideration to your cold start time. The term cold start is actually less than ideal. It, it really talks about the worst possible case where you have to fetch an image to a node from a registry uh, because there is nowhere in your cluster that it is prepared to run immediately. Um, there are happier cases. There's one where essentially we call it uh, disk warm in Knative LAN, and that's where you land on a node that happens to have that image on disk already. That can save several seconds. Uh, if you're even luckier, you will have memory warm. The bits are in RAM and can be converted into a running process probably within a few milliseconds, 50, 100 milliseconds. And of course, there's CPU warm, which means that literally or schedulable, right? It's literally got a process table in the kernel. It's a real, it's a real process uh, and you can put it in immediately. And interestingly enough, that one is not something that's supported directly by Kubernetes. There's, there's no way to use, for example, a C group freeze to suspend the process, but still retain it in memory and still retain a bunch of context about it for a fast resurrection. The reason I bring this up is that probably the single biggest thing you can do to make the autoscaler happy is to lower your cold start time. Yes, the size of your image is one aspect of that, and a lot of folks fixate on that. So I know that it's very fashionable to do things with Alpine. I am skeptical of Alpine. It's gotten better in the last year or two than it used to be, but it used to be, for example, that there was nobody whose full-time job it is to apply security patches in a timely fashion. Uh, and that kind of matters uh, in, in this age. Um, similarly, it uses unusual, or maybe that's not the right way to put it, an uncommon or less commonly used libc uh, uh, muscle which is smaller it's it's you know it's it's a tidy neat little arrangement made for embedded programming uh, but it leads to surprising incompatibilities there's there's a great deal of code that explicitly or implicitly assumes that you're using glibc which is a much bigger beast um, but you know storied and widely used and widely trusted it also turns out that making the image just physically smaller is not the only potential win. A really important thing is establishing that disk warm status. If you have layers of an operating system present on a node, then they don't have to be pulled. And so by the time you have something like if you build all your code with Red Hat or you build all of your code with Ubuntu, by the time your system's been running for a little while, then those layers are already present on all the nodes. And the only thing that has to be pulled is the top layers that distinguish your image. Um, and those are the only things you need to keep small. It turns out at that point, there's no advantage to something like Alpine. And then the disadvantages start to weigh and it becomes advantageous to go, all right, I trust Canonical to keep Ubuntu up to date and to deal with bugs and to backport things. And I trust Red Hat to likewise keep Red Hat and Fedora up to date and backport bugs. And I trust both of those organizations to do those things. There's a lot to be said for setting up your build process to have as much commonality as possible to take advantage of that cache locality or that cache repetition. In the book, I talk about using build packs for that purpose. I think they're excellently suited to that purpose. I recognize also that many people don't use build packs or have yet to recognize the transcendental light of beauty that is build packery, but have a look at them and take, it, take a look. But if you can't do that, keep an eye on the structure of your Docker files. Try to find ways to make layers in common as much as possible. And by in common, they do need to be byte for byte identical to be in common. But where you can manage that, it's worth managing. The other thing that's important, of course, in your startup time is your software, how long your software takes to become live. This can vary quite a lot. Uh, if you're using classic sort of Spring Boot uh, on an older J JVM with, uh, with slow class loading, it could take several seconds because um, it's you know laboriously loading class files one at a time. And by it, I mean the JVM. Spring is only partly to blame. That is unfortunate. And you would probably in that case be advised to look into GraalVM or to decide whether you want to use a different technology. Uh, if you have a fast launching interpreter, you know, your nodes, your rubies, your pythons, that's probably not so bad. 
um, your fast launching statics, uh, static binaries that you might have produced with C, C++, Go, Rust, uh, whatever the kids come up with next week. But by and large, if you have fat, if you have low hanging fruit in terms of startup performance, uh, if you profile it and you find that you load a file that you don't need, if you profile your code and you discover that there's a massive loop that pre-computes something that you don't need until the software has been running for 10 minutes, then by all means, take the opportunity to take that out. And the reason for that is that in the period it takes for your software to start responding to requests, the autoscaler is still seeing statistics for arriving requests piling up and it becomes more and more uh, panicked uh, about the situation. It will more and more aggressively scale. If your software is slow to respond, then that's a rational choice. Uh, because it doesn't know, there's no way to know, and this is true of auto, all autoscalers, there's no way to know whether this is a small spike or the beginning of a big spike. Um, so your decisions to scale more and more aggressively in the face of slow starts is rational. So make it easy on the autoscaler. Try to pick things that boot quickly if you can and to make things boot faster. So there's your tangent there. Okay. So we ran two different things. Uh, we saw that we got different uh, amounts of responses. Notice, for example, that the requests per second went from about 113 to 576, or 579, I beg your pardon, uh, that the responses became more variable. That makes sense because we sent more responses and they were spread across more instances. But because we had started with some live, and then we were in luck, there was a lot of things.